So um, I wanted to thank Dan um, for being my co-conspirator and putting this together. And I wanted to acknowledge Nialetti and Liza, who really did all the the real work in organizing today and putting together this beautiful book. So thank you all. Thank you, Liza. Thank you, Nialetti. Um, so I don't want to do a lot of throat clearing, but I just want to say two words about why from my perspective, um, we embarked on this project back in uh, the middle of 2020, uh, I think was when the idea first came in, into my mind. And really the goal, really the purpose of, of this project from my perspective was to serve two goals. Um, one, you messing everything up already? <laughs> That's the hair. <laughs> um, the the first purpose of embarking on this project was to really send a signal at a moment when I think a lot of people were saying that the rise in violence was nothing to worry about. There was a lot of hand waving, I thought, um, towards the end of 2020 about the increase in shootings in New York and other cities. And I think that I wanted to send the signal that it, this was actually something that was serious and required serious attention and, and new thinking, in, in fact. So that, that was the first goal of this project from my perspective. And, and the second goal was really um, in convening a diverse array of experts to really send an underlying message of pluralism and respectful engagement. Um, no offense, but everybody I interviewed, I disagreed with in one way or another. Um, but I also learned just a ton from talking to all these people. Um, they were so wise and so insightful. And all that wisdom is collected in this beautiful thing. And I know you're going to all run home and read it cover to cover. But um, just as a teaser, we've put together uh, two amazing panels for you today. Um, and so this is our first panel, A-list um, combination. Both panels are a mix of people that I interviewed for at the Crossroads, and I threw in a couple of ringers who I wish I had interviewed for at the Crossroads, just to spice things up a little bit. Um, so this is a very 2022 kind of panel. So it features two people I know mostly through Twitter and then two in real life friends. Um, so my two <laughs> Twitter chums are Aaron Chalfin at the, at the end, um, a professor, a newly tenured professor at University of Pennsylvania in, in criminology. Um, <clears throat> Great public intellectual has been writing stuff for the City Journal and, and Niskanen. Uh, great follow on Twitter. I urge you to check him out. Next to him, Peter Moskos, Twitter flamethrower, uh, provocateur, um, uh, professor at John Jay College, and um, someone who um, spent more than a year working as a cop on the beat in Baltimore for his first book, Cop in the Hood, which I recommend very highly, and has got a new book coming out on uh, an oral history talking to police about the great crime decline in, in New York City. Liz Glazer. Um, Liz is, in my estimation, the most important criminal justice official in New York City over the past decade or so, first as an advisor to the governor, then as advisor to the mayor, um, former colleague of mine at the Center for Court Innovation, and the founder of Vital City. <clears throat> and this is not a Vital City event, but Vital City is this great organization that Liz just created that just released its first uh, policy journal earlier this month. And in full disclosure, I helped her put that together. So. <laughs> Here. <laughs> uh, so that's Liz Glazer. And finally, Marlon Peterson, also a former colleague of mine at the Center for Court Innovation, Center for Court Innovation, a uh, man of many talents, a uh, podcaster, a uh, violence interrupter, writer, a beautiful memoir called Bird Uncaged. Go out and buy it tomorrow. It will change your life. The great Marlon Peterson. So that's, that's our crew for today. Um, so uh, this is going to be relatively unstructured. I'm going to throw questions at them for about an hour, and then I'll open it up for questions from the field, both in person and online. Um, and without being too schematic about it, I think of this as having kind of a three-act structure. This, this panel is going to be about what's happening in, in New York City, and we want to look backwards at the present and then at the future um, over the course of the panel. 
Um, so that's more or less what we're going to do. So before we talk about the present and what's gone wrong, I want to take a step back and look, provide some context because in my estimation, a lot has gone right in New York over the past generation. And we're coming off of 20, 30 years when, you know, from my lights, basically every criminal justice indicator that we care about was headed in the right direction, right? We had crime down, we had jail down, use of force down, stop and frisk down. So I want to talk for a couple minutes about what was going right in New York uh, up until relatively recently. And so I guess I maybe wanted to start with you, Liz, since you were at the helm for at least part of that. What were we doing right up until relatively recently? I was really hoping that somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I mean, I think no one knows. <laughs> All right. <laughs> this is going to be a quick panel. Um, <laughs> okay, I'm done now. Mm. <laughs> Cocktails? <laughs> um, you know, I don't think anybody knows nationally or locally what happened. And a lot of ink has been spilled. And I think the scholars on the panel, you know, will know this better than me. No one knows why crime suddenly exploded in the 80s and why it dropped like crazy in the 90s all over the country, but more steeply and durably in New York. But I think there are a couple of things that I would just say. Um, I think police definitely had a role to play um, in calming the streets. Um, I think we learned a lot about what the price was that we paid for police um, being sort of the primary actor. But there were all kinds of other things that were going on. We had an economy that was booming um, and a million other things that these guys will know about. There are people who talk about you know, lead and the effect that that had. I mean, there's every reason um, on the face of the planet beyond police that people talk about. And so the one thing that I had actually wanted to say, <laughs> hoping what everybody go first or knows the answer to this question, is I think it's really interesting that when we talk about or try to speculate about um, why crime declined, we do examine a broad array of issues. You know, the aging of the baby boomers, uh, all the things that I just mentioned, and yet when crime goes up, our immediate reflex is flood the zone. And we don't think seriously or give weight to perhaps we should turn on the lights. <laughs> perhaps we should invest in summer youth employment and summer youth employment collect connected to other things. Um, so I just wanted to, you know, put that gun on the mantelpiece so I could fire it and act free. <laughs> <laughs> so Peter, as you listen to that, I mean, I feel like we came off a period where police were getting all the credit for the crime decline. And now it feels like we're kind of in the reverse where people don't want to credit police with any part of the crime decline. Are we giving, how do we give the police the right amount of credit, I guess would be the question. I don't know if it's so important to give police, I mean, it would be nice to give police the right amount of credit. I think it's, but in a way, I don't think it, whether it's a medium amount or a lot, like, you know, I find that almost less important than the looking at what actually happened. Um, and I think Liz is being modest um, because she and I have spoken about this in the past, uh, the role of the prosecution uh, that, that started um, in when the crime decline started. Um, that's what, I mean, it's a big jigsaw puzzle that you put together. I focus on the police side, so, you know, keep that in mind that I'm, I'm you know, I'm not an expert in mental health and these other issues. Um, but I would say that to, to, I do think I, partly because I'm writing a book about it, so I better have some competence. In <laughs> I do think I know why crime went down, at least the, the police part of it, which I think was, was huge. Um, and it, it started with just a fundamental shifting of attitude that it's the role of police to focus on crime. And I think um, either we've forgotten or we're not old enough to remember that, that police were not focused on crime in the 70s and 80s. Um, and that is a transition that happened in the NYPD when Brett came on and 
brought on Jack Maple and, and, and his crew, and they said, we're going to talk about crime. And that was a, to take this large organization with all its inertia and, and you know, 200 years of history unencumbered by progress is, is a, sort of a cliche of a lot of city organizations. Um, to, to, to shift that around and do it so quickly mattered. And there, I mean, we don't have time, uh, so, you know, I'm cocktail later, I can oh. tell you for hours about the specific things, but it was an attitude shift. I said, this is our job. Um, and it went away from the root causes uh, theories that I think, as far as I can tell, if not originated, at least uh, got traction with the Kerner Commission in the late 60s in response to urban riots that said it's society's problem and the role of police is to basically um, not provoke, not be racist, not be brutal, and come when called. And that call and response model of policing um, made police departments focus on corruption. I mean, for good reason, because then you have Serpico and the Knapp Commission. Um, but the, the job of the NYPD was largely to stay out of trouble and stay out of the newspapers as much as possible. Um, until the 90s happened. Um, I do want to take a quick moment to talk about those macro issues to say what it's not. Um, look, ultimately none of us know for sure the role of declining lead um, or Roe versus Wade, um, though that's been more debunked. Clearly lead isn't good in the environment, you know, so, um, but the idea that that would cause a 10% reduction in murders in 1994 and a 15% reduction in murders in 1995 is absurd. Um, it was a gradual decline that was obviously beneficial. Um, but policies and leadership matter. Um, it's not something in the air. Uh, so yeah, um, demographics, poverty, the economy may have been booming, but poverty in New York increased in the 90s. There were more people living in poverty in 2000 than in 1990 in New York, um, which also means inequality increased. Um, the demographic factors, which I obviously have some importance, um, simply it, it doesn't explain the crime decline. Um, and I think people quickly go to those things. Oh, yeah, I mean, unemployment went up during that decade in New York City. Um, nor to jump to the present would it explain this great increase recently. Um, but I think there's a problem in, in there's almost a, a hope that it's these macro issues we can't control, I think, because it, it passes the buck and so it's not our responsibility. Um, Violent crime in America, it's, 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 it's a small sub-segment of a segment of, you know, a group of the population. It's segregated, it's isolated. In a way, you know, what happens in Westchester County is sort of irrelevant to a large extent. Um, policing is a very interpersonal um, occupation. Um, I think it's much more important to focus on the institutional factors and, and the micro levels than, than, than the big picture. You can get lost in that. So Aaron, you have recently written that there was not one crime decline, there was two crime declines. What did you mean by that? Yeah, so the 1990s, right, we all know about the 1990s uh, homicide in New York went down a little, a little bit over 70%, but went down nationally by over half during the 1990s. So, you know, New York was the beneficiary of this residual decline, uh, but, you know, this was a, a tide that swept all ships. If you look at the, the most recent decade, let's say from 2010 until up until March of 2020, uh, homicide and shootings go down by half in New York. They go down 50% at a time when nationally homicides were, were actually flat or maybe even rising uh, starting in 2015. So in some ways, I think the last 10 years, New York City are more incredible than what happened in the 1990s because it's, it's really bucking this national trend to, to, to a large extent. Uh, and, you know, if you, if you remember 2010, right, in New York, 2010 was a banner year. We all felt pretty good about uh, the decline in crime and violence that we'd seen uh, from 1990 to 2010. And I think probably it's right that not many people would have seen it, would have, would have thought it possible, right, to have another 50% reduction in homicide given the level that we'd hit in 2010. So uh, I think the last 10 years have been, uh, well, up until 2020, were, were really exciting uh, in New York City. And, and frankly, allowed policymakers to uh, not just fight fires all the time and to think about uh, meaningful reform and other ways to create public safety. Uh, obviously, 2020 has um, flipped the world around, and we're all, I think, still adjusting to that a little bit. Um, I'm sure we'll get into some of that. But yeah, I think not just one great crime decline, but, but two, at least in New York. So Marlon, to you, um, one of the interesting theories that I've seen 
uh, advanced to, to explain at least part of the crime decline is that neighborhoods with strong nonprofit infrastructures, with business improvement districts, with other kinds of um, prevention programs, um, are more successful at reducing crime than other neighborhoods. And being a frontline worker within a neighborhood based, you know, community nonprofit, does that ring true to you that, that that kind of civic infrastructure is an important piece of the puzzle? Yeah, of course it does. I think um, the thing about these civic organizations or nonprofits, CBOs, what have you, that they are people from the community in these organizations. So the other, the one other way to frame that is that how have people from the neighborhood, from these communities, help improve the conditions in the neighborhoods, right? I think it's sort of like a desire to push it towards an institutional title, right? Um, I lived in the same neighborhood that I worked in, right? Um, so it was me from my neighborhood, just what happened, I got a check for it. But it was that I lived in my neighborhood and so did my colleagues or living in adjacent neighborhoods. Um, I think some of the list that earlier at the outset, I think it's probably the most profound thing I've heard thus far, not take away anything from it. <laughs> 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 uh, she said, I don't know. She said, I don't know. I don't know what that reason was. I think that like what was the cause for the great decline or, or we can go to what's the, what's the cause for the sharp, sharp in, uh, increase. I'm not saying that there's a complete ignorance to the issue, but what I'm saying is that I think that there is a quick desire to pinpoint that reason why it's happening, right? As if people from all the neighborhoods in these communities got together and said around 2020, we're gonna get together and rise crime. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, right, they, that's, that's not how it happens, right? So it would, I'm not saying so much that it's just that they don't, we don't know. I'm saying that there are varying reasons why these things happen. And the mere fact that there are varying reasons requires varying responses. So yes, of course, community-based uh, uh, um, interventions work and preventions work. Yes, there's a role that law enforcement plays. I think the, the I think we get caught up in where that we have to say this is what we need to do because even though we don't know what the, why it really happened, oftentimes we and we'll probably get to this that like well, we're looking at in our current administration here in New York City since we're talking about New York City. Well, we need to put more law enforcement in the area. Then we don't sure why it's happening, but we need to put them in the area. And I think that's sort of just like what we do all the time. If you go on YouTube, you would see panels just like this in the 1970s in the 1980s. And oftentimes, it would be similar things that like we need to flood these zones, these communities. Um, and, or we need to have more uh, money for programs in these communities. I'm saying that, yeah, these things are consistent. I think the way we sort of run into a lot, a lot of problem, uh, Greg, is that we, we need to define that reason immediately. And if this is a public health issue as we, as we as has become the common language now, then if there's any, any, any sort of rampant COVID, the spread of COVID, we're still figuring out so much of this disease in the moment, right? Um, should we have a mask? Am I shaking hands with people still giving me elbows? Like we're still somewhat not sure, but somehow because we have this increase in uh, violence in 2020, when the pandemic hit, the street hit the fan, we think we need to define it immediately. And I think that's, and then when we define immediately, the people that get run under are the people who are in the communities themselves. So most, ooh. All right. um, so most of this conversation is focused on the crime reduction, but I did want to say that other things were heading in the right direction too, including notably the jail population. So what were we doing right in terms of getting the jail population down up until relatively recently? Since you're looking at me, yes. uh, I will answer. Um, and I also wanted to follow up on something that Marlon said, and I think the two are connected, and I think it's also connected to what Aaron was talking about. Uh, I do think that there was room to grow uh, or room to breathe, you know, by 2010 or so, or maybe even earlier than that. And there is a kind of virtuous cycle that I think happened in New York City, and I see so many of the people in this room, uh, and hopefully also listening, who led those things, um, which is, we began to understand that arrest isn't everything, <laughs> uh, locking people up isn't everything, uh, that there are a lot of other ways to put people on a path to a better life 
that doesn't include a completely punitive approach. And so there is a very intentional effort um, on the part of the defenders and prosecutors and public officials who funded alternatives to in, in detention and uh, alternatives to incarceration um, to rethink about when is it that we should really use this awesome power of the hand of the state uh, to respond to uh, to behavior that is you know uh, that is hurting people. And so you had this sort of uh, effect of fewer people were being arrested for lower level crimes. Uh, people who were being arrested, there was more and more use of alternatives to detention and incarceration. There was more attention to how long people actually stayed, uh, less success in that area. Um, and so I think all of that sort of fed on itself, and the more that happened, and I see somebody here who really led sort of those programs, the more judges who really end up being the fulcrum of who is in and who is out were hungry for the kinds of programs that were being um, given. But, I, but can I just yeah. follow up on something? Because yeah. I thought um, you said something incredibly profound, I thought. <laughs> Which is, yeah, right, we keep trying to say, well, it was the police or it was whatever that concrete thing that you can hold in your hand and see, that's what reduced crime um, or that's what will reduce crime. And in fact, it's obviously much more complicated than that. Um, you know, crime is about behavior. How is behavior changed and controlled? It's all these like inchoate things. You're, your neighbors, your family, the people you hang out with. Um, and those kinds of connections um, are, I think, the things that, yeah, it could be institutionalized in a community-based organization or a nonprofit or whatever, but it's actually more than that. It's just simply the way we connect to one another. And in the main, that's actually in 99% of life, what we rely upon to ensure that we live peaceably together, not in the first instance, call the police to help me with the fight I'm having with John. So something changed in 2020. Um, so help me. On one hand, you have some on the left saying, it was way worse in 1992. You don't have to worry about it. And then you have some people on the right who I seem to like want us to head back to the bad days and seem to be salivating over every bad video or every horrible case. So I guess I want to ask, put you all on the spot each in a row, on a scale of one to 10, how concerned should we be about the increase in shootings in New York City? With one being meh, no biggie and 10 being the sky is fucking falling, excuse me, friggin' falling. <laughs> <laughs> the Google. <guy>. Yeah. <laughs> Aaron, one to 10. Wow, okay. Um, yeah, I'm gonna go, I'm, I'm gonna go at like 6.5. <laughs> I couldn't decide between six and seven. Academic. <laughs> I was thinking between seven and eight, so. 7.5 and a 6.5. Liz. Yeah, I would go eight or more. This means you have to go 9.5. <laughs> yeah, I go higher. Really? The reason, and the reason why I say if I could, it's found when people get shot, you should be very concerned. I think that we should always be very concerned, even if it seems I'm from the 90s, but I grew up in the middle of this. So I, yes, quantity wise, there's more shooting and people being killed back then. We should always be very concerned. I think the approach to that concern is what is where the nuance lies. Absolutely. And if I can find, yeah, yeah, one of the things I just find so more than frustrating um, in the past two years is the amount of people who aren't at risk telling other people not to worry about it. Um, I find it unconscionable. Um, getting shot is horrible. Um, and a lot of people just have no contact with violence and therefore contextualize it and rationalize it. Um, that's, yeah. So Marlon, when I interviewed you for at the crossroads, you said that when you were growing up, getting a gun was 
easier than getting a pair of sneakers. Do you have a sense? Is that still the case? Yeah, I can give you a little context to that. This is a little bit like how that was misquoted, though. Oh, I misquoted you? <laughs> um, <laughs> <this phone>. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I was running a youth program uh, from the center, you, you, you OSOS, and I was working with a group of young people at that time. And, and this is in the early 2000, 2011, 12, somewhere around there. And a kid said to me, guns are like, sne like sneakers. It just matter which one you want to get. When I was growing up in the 90s, the first gun I ever got was at a corner store, right? I'm saying that guns, of course, they're more easier to get. I mean, you look statistically, there's about 10 million guns manufactured in this country every year. 2021, in January, there was record numbers for how many guns were like purchased in this country. So when, when new guns are made, old guns go somewhere, right? And they filter down to neighborhoods in our communities. So without question, they're much easier to get, and we can create them now. For, you know, we think about uh, uh, you know 3D weapons. So like. Without question, weapons are more accessible in America. There are more of those things than there are us people here. So I don't. I think it would be quite logical to expect that there would be an increase in the underground economy of weapons and accessibility of them. So Aaron, you recently released a thing that I found interesting that was looking at even though crimes other than shootings have gone down, uh, as has been fairly well documented during the pandemic, you argued that we shouldn't be satisfied with that because your chances of being a victim of street street encounter, street violence actually went up. Explain to me how that's possible. Yeah, so, so the narrative about 2020, right, was that the homicides and the shootings were way up and, and everything, was, everything else was down, right? Uh, but we all stayed inside more. And so uh, what my colleague and I tried to do in, in, in a recent paper that we wrote is to figure out when people were out and about on the street, uh, were they facing a higher risk that they would be uh, the victim of a violent crime? And you know what we find is that in April of May of 2020, just during that lockdown period, for people who are out and about, the risk of being victimized is up maybe by about a third uh, in New York. And then you know it sort of abates a little bit over the course of 2020. Uh, looking at the remainder of 2020, the risk of being a, a victim of a violent crime is up by about 15% uh, for people who are outdoors in New York. Uh, we don't think that's just an artifact of like higher risk people being outside and lower risk people being inside. We looked at that in a lot of different ways. So I, I think actually the, you know, the sort of paradox that people are talking about isn't much of a paradox. It was just a measurement problem. Uh, you know, I, I think um, you know, looking at the 2020 data, um, if, if we had done this analysis at the end of 2020, might have predicted that 2021 would not have been a great year uh, for public safety. Um, so, so I, you know, I think that's just an important, um, uh, you know, sort of part of the story uh, in 2020. Also, wanted to follow up on on, on Marlon's point about getting a gun. Uh, you know, and I I just look at the data, right? So, uh, you know, I, I definitely am a step removed from what's been happening in, in communities, but. Uh, it certainly appears as though more guns were being carried in 2020 than they had been previously. So uh, the cops are stopping way fewer people in 2020 than they were in the past. They were doing fewer searches, but they're seizing more guns. And that starts happening in March of 2020. It doesn't start after the murder of George Floyd. It starts earlier. And so there's something about 2020 that caused people to decide, you know, I think I feel less safe, right? I think I should carry a gun with me. Uh, and, and that's part of the challenge of unraveling what happened during the pandemic, that um, the seeds were planted before the George Floyd incident, right? That, that, you know, it does seem, though, there's more gun carrying around it. Then any little conflict can just escalate, right? And, and in fact, you see shootings starting to have that stratospheric rise in New York. Yeah. In early May. Before. This is before, a little bit before. Yeah, that's right. So people have a tendency to point the finger at COVID, right? COVID is a major social dislocation. Um, when I interviewed him for at the crossroads, Jeremy Travis compared it to the crack epidemic. Um, when I interviewed Joe Richardson, who's back here somewhere, he talked about how um, in COVID times, people went online with their beefs and they were able to metastasize online. But help me unpack, like when people blame COVID, what was it about specifically 
the COVID phenomenon that may have contributed to this increase? Is it the breaking of, of social ties between people? Is it the people wearing masks? What is it, Marlon? I think all those things, but also just really want to pinpoint a thing that we consider one of the possibilities. We had, you think about kids in education in schools. Kids not were out of school or they were somehow in front of a computer, sort of like kind of in school, right? But not really in school. That was a tremendous strain on all households, families with resources, families without resources, but definitely more of a strain on families without resources. But you also have these young folks, people speaking about, uh, talking about statistically young folks are the ones who usually respond to the one harmed and the ones who are doing the harm when it comes um, to violent, gun violence particularly. These folks were also not able to interact with each other on a, on, a, on a normal way in which we may have done when we were high school kids or at that age. We weren't able to engage in a way. We weren't able to expend that sort of energy that we would do at school, playing around, doing all the things that, little te that teenagers do. Then you in, 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 include social media into it, where adults don't know how to interact on social media. Adults get into interaction and, and beefs and animosities and agitations over social media. So of course, young people would do it too, right? And so you put all that together, and then you put together people dying around them. You're hearing sirens all the time, particularly you, I'm, I'm in Bedside, you're hearing sirens all the time, particularly around COVID. Um, there's also obviously the, the, the heightened police uh, tensions in the communities around that time. And imagine being 17 or 16, and you're having your feelings hurt by somebody on social media, and all that's happening. And I say your feelings hurt, that matters. We just saw what happened on TV the other day, when your feelings get hurt, right? Somehow we think that when it comes to teenagers, we are somehow like, well, why would they do that thing? Well, one, we have to ask, increase accessibility to a to a, a weapon. If I'm mad at you right now, and I can get this right now, right now I'm going to use this thing at the moment, right? So you just just thinking about that. That's like a cauldron that was happening around 2020, um, and you're just stuck on your block, and you can't go too many places, and just sort of thinking about, you know, I, you know, I come from a certain era at that time, and I get to wear masks all the time, right? I'm just, I'm just thinking about it, so I keep it right, like, and I get to wear masks all the time, so I won't look weird or crazy if I'm doing something that I'm not supposed to be doing, and I'm dealing with all these other underlying factors. Like, for a moment of looking from a place of empathy, empathy for these young folks, from a place of empathy, I understand it. Peter? Slightly. I may be contrarian, but different perspective. Um, I, I, I can't, I, I don't want to say the words COVID is overrated because damn it, it's not. Um, it's a global pandemic and New York was hit horribly hard and hearing you talk about those sirens actually kind of <laughs> even go, oh my God. Um, it was very real here. Um, I just know, I know too many people died. Um, but yeah, violence was going up a little bit before. It's funny because if you try to emphasize that public policy matters and perhaps some of the reform has been, some of the reform has been counterproductive. Um, then people say COVID and if you say, well, it's COVID or George Floyd, then they say violence was going up before. All these things are important. Um, there was a lot of criminal justice reform in 2020 that I think contributed to a slight rise in violence. And maybe that's a price we're willing to pay as society. Um, you know, maybe New York City can have 400 murders instead of 300 if it results in Y amount of decarceration or some, you know, some sort of equation like those are discussions that I think we need to have. Um, so yeah, it wasn't, didn't go from zero to 100, but there are a couple things that are important to mind. Violence did not increase when COVID started. It's a massive increase. There was a separate little trend. Um, it increased late May, early June after with George Floyd protests. Um, that, I mean, there's a clear delineation there. And yeah, COVID was still going on. I don't think you can say COVID's irrelevant. And, um, but also, I don't really believe in American exceptionalism. Um, we're very parochial. There's, I mean, it only happened in America. It's a global pandemic. Why didn't any other country see this rise in violence? That includes or Canada. Happened. They did. Maybe. It, it includes Canada. It includes Mexico. It includes Western Europe. Um, the rise in violence. What, what other countries did see a rise in violence? I'm from the Caribbean. It's Trinidad, so I'm, and I've been involved in this issue here. So there was definitely a rise in. And Trinidad um, was pretty high to start with, right? Right, and there was a there was a rise during that, that period of time. Oh, okay, that. Um, and it may be the access to guns that it, you know it may be necessary but not sufficient. But to say it's COVID in a global pandemic is is I vastly overblown. Um, it, it's other factors. Um, it's it's too much of an excuse. And again, it's something we can't really control. Um, I, because 
Well, coming from the political left, I, you know, I have my own strong positions um, that on gun policy and being more restrictive. And I fear, by the way, for what's going to happen in New York soon because our current system is clearly unconstitutional um, in you know, light of the Supreme Court decisions from whenever the DC <coughs> Chicago decisions were. Um, and it's strange that New York City did not take it on itself to fix things before the court. I, I worry about what the court's going to say, but it's not going to get better. But my point is, um, again, none of this changed in the 90s. We're kind of stuck with the gun policy we have because we're America. Um, I'm willing to deal with the cards as they're dealt. I would like to change it, but again, that's not my field. I'll leave that to others to change, to focus on guns. Um, we can reduce violence without uh, changing gun laws. Um, New York, it, it went in very much in the wrong direction in the past two years. I find it revealing that the percentage of murders committed in New York with a gun were far lower than any other city, including Newark, New Jersey, which has similar gun laws and is literally a subway right away. So there's something that made New Yorkers less likely to have access to a gun to shoot somebody. Um, and that is, I think, what we have to sort of figure out because, yes, there's a problem with too many guns, but I don't know how we're going to change that realistically, but we don't need to. Um, we'll always have higher levels of violence than country, you know, Western European nations with strict gun control and social welfare and all that stuff. Um, but at least we could get back to where we were a few years ago if we, if, you know, if we really put on our thinking caps and had the political will. Aaron, is there evidence that the police stepped away from proactive policing in the wake of the Floyd protests? Yeah, or even before. I mean, uh, you know, we had a public health crisis and the number of stops and searches uh, was down even before the protests. So, you know, we, we have a city where the police played a pretty central role, I think. Um, I, I would agree with, with Peter that uh, I think, you know, shifts in policing do explain uh, a, a portion of, you know, what went right in the last 10 years. Uh, but then all of a sudden the police are pulling back, right? And uh, it creates uncertainty. Uh, people do start carrying guns at a high rate. Uh, you know, I, Peter referenced these incredible statistics. So in New York City, uh, prior to the pandemic, what was it about maybe 55, 60% of the homicides were uh, gun homicides. Look at a city like Chicago, that, that's gonna be 90%, right? So New York really was uh, an exception. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, there's a lot of research that suggests that the presence and vi visibility of police officers matters for crime. Uh, that when, you know, for example, police officers pulled away to deal with the traffic accident, crime goes up where that officer would have been patrolling. So, uh, you know, I, I think that's got to matter. I think there's a lot of other stuff going on also, right? I, you know, what happened in 2020, research is never really gonna fully unpack because so many things changed at the same time. Um, I think an important part of that is policing, uh, but the fraying of ties uh, between people and their neighbors and, and their communities uh, matters also. Um, you know, it's true that, that America was, was pretty exceptional in 2020, that other countries didn't experience uh, what we experienced. Um, you can talk about guns, you can talk about the fragmented nature of gangs and groups, right? So El Salvador saw a large decrease in homicide in 2020, but they have a very, very different structure of, of you know, the way violence happens. So yeah, I mean, a lot here, right? But I, I do think um, there is evidence of de-policing. Uh, I think the George Floyd, Floyd protests probably um, in some sense made it harder or demotivated the police in terms of regaining control. Uh, but I think the seeds were planted before those protests. Uh, <laughs> Liz. Um, so I uh, have a fundamental question or problem or thought or hypothesis that's uh, not necessarily based on so much scholarship. But um, you definitely see in New York City uh, it as uh, shootings just skyrocket um, that police draw down uh, and, you know, plummeting gun arrests, for example. We can't really tell about shooting arrests or shooting for because we can't track that, etc. Anyway, but there's another thing that happens as well, um, which is residents draw back to in a major, major way. And of course, this is all very, very rough. 
But if you measure the clearance of shootings, um, which is a eyewitness, <laughs> uh, you know, the evidence is eyewitness, meaning you have to have a civilian come forward and tell you, unless the cop sees the shooting happen. The clearance rates for uh, shootings dropped, particularly in the neighborhoods that were affected, uh, to something like 23%. Like one in five. Now we've never been that great at clearing stuff. You know, maybe shootings. Our clearance rate was fifty percent, fifty-five percent. But dropping to that indicates that something else is going on. And and so for me, when you say, and I've seen your excellent research that you know the presence of police deters crime. Da, 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 I wonder whether we shouldn't take very very seriously the degree to which that presence relies upon some interaction and trust between residents and cops. And that what we saw during 2020 was just the curtain pulled back on a very uneasy relationship to begin with. Um, and it also makes me think, therefore, that the response is not necessarily more cops, which then leads to more cops saying, how can we make ourselves more attractive to the neighborhood? Okay, we're going to do graffiti programs and basketball programs, I mean, which seems utterly at odds with what civic society is all about. Um, and so I wonder whether, uh, I, I don't doubt that presence deters criminal activity. The question is, does it have to be the presence of an armed officer? Um, or can it be another kind of presence? Can, <laughs> Peter, and then Marlon. Can I propose Aaron's next research project? <laughs> um, I, I don't, I, I think Wait, this I needs got to, one from. <laughs> uh, I, I want to just put this out there as a question. I think it's, there's something here, but I don't know. Um, Aaron's got a researcher. Uh, Shootings are solved because um, two things have changed that I think matter a lot. First of all, people aren't in detention, um, so they're not talking. Um, that's how quarantine. Detention, um, for like pre-trial detention, to get out of jail, you give up a shooter. Um, it's not generally the neighbor looking out the window that gives the shooter out. It's someone else. It's somebody involved in other crimes. So we've lost that leverage, the debriefing aspect. You're arrested, if you, you know, we might let you go if it's a minor crime. Um, it's got to have an impact, I don't know how much. Um, the other factor about witnesses, um, first of all, they're worried about their anonymity now because the defense can get their contact information even if it's somewhat removed, but at some point why risk it? And the person who was arrested with the gun is back on the street that night. That has got to have some chilling effect on people talking. It's their neighbor. It's a lot easier to, to cooperate with officials um, when the actual criminal isn't staring at you every day. I don't know what the impact of this, but, but, but I don't think it should be ignored. I would just say that, uh, at least with respect to the last one, about people being back on the street, I don't know that that's changed so much. You know, For gun possession, it hasn't? I mean, you will be held in on a federal gun crime, but for a state gun crime, I mean, it, it, it's quite consistent. You know, even if when bail is set, people are out very, very quick. <clears throat> Marlon, you want to get in? A couple of things. I think um, if we sort of look at the places in the city where there has been increases of violence, because it's not entire, it's not, it's not out here, right? Right. There's certain places. And if you want to go by precincts, there's certain precincts. When you go by these precincts in these certain neighborhoods, it has generally been in those same neighborhoods and those same precincts since before I was born, right? And which is 1970. You know, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> like, so there's something to be thinking about. What's, what is that telling us something about it? Now, it's one way to look at it, a racist play. It's these black and brown people, they just can't get it together. That's one way some people could look at that, right? But they can also look at all the other social determinants in those particular communities. Why is that in these, these particular communities we've had these things? Because it's also in these particular communities where when there's been an uptick in any sort of violence, we have given the same resource. Police, 
in that same community. So just sort of thinking about if, if I am a researcher, one of the questions I would ask are police effective in reducing crime in these areas? That is a, that's, a, that's a question to ask. It may be a hard one to ask, it may be an unpopular one to ask, and maybe a politically incorrect one to ask, but it's a question to ask. And I think that, you know, and the other thing I want to sort of just think about, we spoke about clearance rates, which is ultimately a decline in trust between police and community. And if we're using George Floyd, could we're using that as a marker here, a time marker, that's the way we should use that marker, not necessarily using a marker like it just became more violent because of George Floyd protests. We can use it as a marker to say, well, that increased police community trust relations, which probably led to less cooperation and uh, lower clearance rates. Um, when we think about these, 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 you know, the thing about the George Floyd part. But the thing about the clearance rate I think is significant is ultimately, as I said at the outset, when you think about these community-based organizations or institutions, what have it, it's the people in the community that helps do it. I think what, like that's, we somehow always jump over that. We leapfrog over that because these folks don't have, you know, titles or what have you. The people in the community are the ones that we should think about. So if you think about those precincts that we think about that where there's a consistent, has been sadly consistent in violence, what are we doing to support the people in that community to get themselves out of that? Because if I was a police officer, I would say, and I'm great friends with some, like, I would say, well, we need the, poli the people in this community to help us. Police officers always say that. We need the people's help. However, somehow, when we're in policy conversations, we just say we need the police to help. It's something switches there, and I think it's a part of our conditioning to believe that the, the fastest thing to do, for instance, now we're having this conversation, I mean, you've been doing this for a long time, Greg, but like this sort of thing about New York City, where we have the mayor, like in three months, somehow some of us expect it, and he probably expects to end gun violence in the city. In three months, <laughs> it's impossible. Even when we think about the issues of like criminal justice reform policies, bail reform, and all these sort of things, or we call DAs looking at things in a different way, it has been two, three years that we've given these people to give us the results that we want, that law enforcement has been able to give us since 1979. I'm just using my, that's when I was born, right, 1979. I'm just sort of thinking like when we had this conversation about violence, gun violence particularly, because violence and gun violence are not always the same thing. There's, you know, there's so many other things that are happening besides somebody picking up a gun. We somehow keep leaving the community as the number one antidote to it. Can I ask Marla, can I ask you a question? I'm mm -hmm. curious. When people talk about the community, I, is it unfair to ask to put these issues on a concept of community? And what I'm saying is, so I, I live in Queens, and if someone were to be shot in my block, I would be offended if someone says, what are you doing to help your community? Oh, my community? I'm a New Yorker, whatever. <laughs> I don't, um, why, it's, it strikes me that public safety should be perceived as a public utility like electricity and like it's something the state's supposed to provide. Um, how do we reconcile neighborhoods and communities? I mean, I don't know if it's a good question, but I guess I'm getting question. that. It's a great question. I always say a gun violence is a visible display of a lot of un underlying tra uh, traumas. So when I think about community, I say community, I'm not saying community. The only way community can create or help and create safety in the community is by, in the neighborhood is by telling the police that what happened. That's just one way, right? I created, I ran youth programs. That's another way. There are people who are educators. That's another way. There, like there's so many other ways. It's like saying hi to people in your neighborhood who we may be in fear of, saying good morning, bro. Good morning, you good? All right. Like there are ways in which community impacts outside of the like the police. Like when when we need to get them arrested, I think that we we somehow lock into the arrest part. Like how do we get these folks off the streets? Right. By the time they did the thing, they did the thing. We're talking about how we prevent them from doing the thing and or and like like. I, you know, people who know me in the rooms, good friends and colleagues, I went to prison for the thing, right, for the thing. But there were so many other things that were happening that could have been interventions before that. That's what I'm speaking about community. I'm not only talking about the clearance, the, you know, police, people calling the police or interacting. Because historically, it's only been older folks in our community who have done those things anyway. It hasn't been young folks doing those things, right? And, and you know, so I think it's a great question. And I think we should expand these questions around how community helps community. Identify it, pinpoint it, highlight it. You know, like education is a huge part of it. Like the education system is a huge part, not only as 
to the, the, like the math and science part of it, but I'm talking about the interactions that these folks have with these people on a daily basis. They are like super important. There really should be an organization devoted to creating a vital city. Um, <laughs> a good idea. Um, uh, so the specter of bail reform has come up a couple of times. I want to ask for your help in parsing what's going on with bail reform. Because on the one hand, we have thousands of people out now who might have been in. So logic suggests that you're going to get an increase in crime like from, from that. On the other hand, when I look at the data, and I haven't done a deep dive, but it suggests that very few of these people while they're out are committing violent felony offenses. So how do you read the impact of bail reform? Liz Glazer. I always get confused on this topic um, because you have to hold 49 opposing thoughts in your head at the same time. And what I mean by that is the whole snarl over bail reform in New York City is about why is crime going up? It's because of bail reform. No, it's not because of bail reform. And yet the nature of the statute has nothing to do with whether people are getting rearrested or what kind of activity is being conducted out on the street. New York State only permits a judge to set conditions to assure that person to come back to court. Not, not to ensure that that person will not shoot somebody or carry a gun or whatever. And so I, it always, I always feel like we're sweeping the floor with an ice cube you know, great. Okay. It's a beautiful metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> I thought of it. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, meaning maybe you'll get the floor clean, but that's not really what it was created for. Uh, so, uh, so then when you have things like what's now going on in Albany, where there's, you know, the governor has a 10 point plan that she's put forward it's just flashing lights and colors. People aren't even pretending. It's about get people back to court. The, the discussion is all about danger. And, and so, and not for nothing, but despite the fact that it's just been about getting people back to court, I think that talking to any judge, uh, they would tell you the thing that is front of mind is, is this person who I'm about to release going to shoot somebody? Danger is the thing that they are thinking, and danger is the thing that the police commissioner is talking about and the papers in New Yorkers. And so I just feel we're having this conversation that is um, using the wrong thing to solve a problem. The ice cube, sweeping with the ice cube. Peter. Um, there's a lot of good in bail reform. I mean, first of all, it's a big, complicated, there's a lot going on there as people in this room probably know. It would be so easy to fix it and make it. Um, I fear that advocates for bail reform are, who want to use it as a stepping stone to abolition of jails, prisons, and police are going to be in for a bad surprise if they don't fix it. Um, because there will be an inevitable right wing lock them up backlash. Um, the idea that we don't take danger into account, we could just change that, like every other state. That'll be it. Okay, yeah, it would be more people in jail. But if, if that's the- I actually the... wonder if there would be. That, that's okay. the analysis that was... should be done. Yeah. Because I think that there might not be. Not be. But uh, then I... you need to eliminate cash bail. Because cash bail is just- um, Yeah, this idea of, yeah, the pretrial detention is, is something that we're, we want to move towards doing away with entirely is, is not, good policy. Um, so we could fix it and keep the good and get rid of some of the bad. But there's also, yeah, there's a distant, the New York Times today or yesterday has reported this figure that I think started in the Times Albany Union, the idea that only 2% commit violence. It's not true. The data is out there. It's publicly available. It's bad data. It doesn't tell you that what that figure is. You can't determine. It's more than 2%. Um, what that data can tell you 
is that 10% of people arrested in New York City have open cases for violent felony offenses, and 35% of everyone arrested has an open case. Now, that's not quite recidivism. So, you know, it's sort of switching recidivism on its head. But, but, we, but that data is at least available. Um, all it tells you is what the first arrest is, is the, which means if you're arrested, if you're out because of bail reform and you have a misdemeanor and then you shoot somebody, it counts as, it only counts the first arrest. So it, it's, it's ugly data, but it's, it's um, I don't know, it just, it's not 2%. It's more than that. So I don't know what, again, what's the number where we start to say, oh, it matters. But we at least need to start being honest with, with the data about it. Um, I'll get back to you. I want to turn to you, Aaron, on this theme of getting rid of the bad. Ask you about the open cases. So, is it imaginable that there's a? And this is the theory that was promulgated 40 years ago by George Kelling and James Q. Wilson in the, in the Atlantic. Is it possible to imagine an approach that keeps the good of broken windows, from my perspective, that um, we should care about social disorder and, and the small things matter without getting, and getting rid of the bad, which would be, you know, the kind of over-criminalization, over-enforcement, particularly in communities of color. Is it even possible to imagine that? Yeah, so I, I'm, you know, fairly optimistic about this. Um, you know, when you, when you think about what the police were doing, you know, leading up to 2011, right, you know, 750,000 street stops in New York, the official count. Um, you know, the marginal, the value of the marginal stop was probably pretty low, right, in terms of public safety, right? So uh, there's, there's research that shows that when a new uh, precinct commander cycles into a, a NYPD precinct, has a very different approach to policing, raises the number of stops, and crime and violence doesn't really respond to that, right? It's, it's, not, it's not a big effect in either direction. So, you know, I, I think it's right that once we tamp down, once we raise stops to, to this really, really high level, um, a lot of those stops were a priori unlikely to have a big effect on, on safety. So I think that, um, you know, it, it's possible to be more focused with what police are doing and get most of the benefits of what police do without making tons and tons of stops. Uh, having said that, I mean, some stops are really productive, right? Um, you know, sometimes you, you, you know, find someone who really, um, you know, might commit a serious crime. So, uh, you know, you want the police to be uh, focused on, on the key people. Uh, I think in New York, you know, one of the things that um, was done very effectively when federal courts put an end to what we think of as mass stop question frisk in New York City is the police department and Federal, and the prosecutors in, in, in the city and federal prosecutors as well did adjust. Uh, and they focused much more on um, building major cases against the um, gangs and groups that are driving a lot of the violence. So they're not stopping people for just walking around public housing because they couldn't show ID, right, indicating that they live there. Uh, you know, it's a much more precise strategy. Uh, I think it was a much more effective way uh, to police in New York City. Um, you know, violence there's, went down during this. Violence went, yeah. violence went down. Um, you know, there are, are still collateral costs to this. Uh, you know, it's precision policing. It's probably not precision prosecution in many respects. Um, but, you know, I, so yeah, I'm, I'm hopeful. I think that what the police do matters. It's not just presence. Um, I think more investigative resources would be a big help. 23% is a very bad number to clear shootings. It's higher than Chicago and some other in Philadelphia, for that matter, by the way, um, but it's, it's bad news. And, you know, if you think about the need for police legitimacy, you know, part of that is obviously about police abuse, but some of it is, is just the feeling that the police aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing, which is uh, solving serious crime. And so um, I think those are the things that, that, that I would focus on just looking at, at the research, but. Liz? That that. So I just wanted to get back to the <laughs> disorder thing. And I have so much to say to you about investigation involving <laughs> So just think about how this conversation just went. You said, what do we think about broken windows and how you deal with issues of disorder in neighborhoods um, that everybody cares about? You know, someone peeing in front of your building. Uh, or worse. <laughs> and, um, and it immediately became a conversation about 
how many stops? Should we arrest people? Should we summons them? And yet, when you think about it, it's not just in issues of disorder, it's in everything else, you know, whether it's gun carrying or whatever. What we're talking about is how do you change behavior and what's the best way to do it? And when you think about what's the best way to change behavior, the world is this big and cops are over here. So is the best way to stop people from drinking in public, if that's really what you care about, and apparently it is, because most of the summonses that we s served in the city of New York are for public drinking. Is the best way to do that, to serve hundreds of thousands of summonses, which is what we did for many years? Then we suddenly said, well, they shouldn't be criminal summonses, they'll be civil summonses. But you know what happens to those summonses? Exactly nothing. And year after year after year, People are still doing the same thing. So if you really care about stopping people from jumping turnstiles, drinking in public, there are other ways to do that that have nothing to do with the criminal justice system. Um, so I, I would just urge that instead of starting with the criminal justice system and thinking about how we live peaceably together, we start in a different way. Peter? If I could give an example, it's just over there, I think, in <laughs> Bryant Park. Oh. Um, and I mention this because I spoke to, the, to Dan Biederman, who started the Bryant Park uh, Corporation and redid the park in the early 90s. And it was it, after getting subway off graffitis in the 80s, it was the first sort of reclamation of public space, the reopening of Bryant Park. And he... Um, overtly said, I'm going to use a broken windows approach. He read the article in The Atlantic and said, wow, this makes sense to me. It kind of articulates what I've been thinking all along. Um, but the reason I mention it is partly because it's, it's on my mind because it's in my book that's coming out, but it, it didn't involve police. It involved broken windows. Brian Park had a near permanent police presence in the 80s. Um, and then they'd arrest some drug dealer and be off the street. Brian Park does not have a police presence today. Um, Public safety was achieved um, through what do you call softscape, urban design. It was a, a, achieved through programming, getting people in the park. Um, very much a sort of a Jane Jacobs idea of eyes on the street. Um, and I think, and you know, and it's still a free park and has nice bathrooms. Um, I think we can agree that Bryan Park is better now than it was, you know, before 1990. Um, and it was done basically not only without policing, but now requires less policing. And, and this is exactly the mm -hmm. point that, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Liz. So uh, for anyone who's read Palaces for the People, Eric Kleinenberg's book, he talks about the Broken Windows article and what it actually said, which was not arrest every single person for every single crime. Um, um, Exactly, um, but rather talked about exactly what you're talking about, which is physical conditions. And he looks at an experiment that was done by the Horticultural Society uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, professors at the University of Pennsylvania in, in uh, Philadelphia, in which they looked, uh, they essentially took lots that had been overgrown uh, and tended to them uh, and fixed up dilapidated places. And you guys will know what the percentage reduction was, but it was some unbelievable reduction in crime uh, by simply doing something that had nothing to do with arrests or anything else, but to do with the change of the physical landscape. And, um, and I think it's a very, very profound point and that Vital City will be dealing with next in its next issue. Um, which is, what, what is it that welcoming public spaces, not, you know, league lights and raked sand, but what is it that inviting public spaces do that knit people together, that make um, a peaceful environment uh, that you can achieve without a million summonses and arrests? So in, in that spirit, I'm going to open it up to questions in a second. But before I do, I want to ask each of you, uh, starting with you, Marlon, to say at least one thing, could be more, that makes you hopeful as you look to the future. Great. 
Um, Notwithstanding your 9.5 uh, fear level. No, no. Um, I had a daughter. That makes me hopeful mm -hmm. um, for it. Um, and and, and, uh, and it's the reason behind that is that, like, there, these ho hopefully, as we have more nuanced conversations, by the time she's at our age, I'm not saying gun violence would have been eradicated because we believe in that so much as a country, but I believe that we may have sort of expanded the notion of how we deal with it in various ways uh, before we get to the gun violence part. But the other thing I think, um, and I can't believe I'm going to say this, and it's being recorded, so <laughs> I got to think about it. Like, so this, I was listening in preparation, I was listening to um, Eric Adams, his gave a speech when he was, um, Mayor Adams, excuse me, when he was give, uh, introducing his blueprint to end violence in, in New York City. And in it, along with, you know, all the, you know, increased different types of enforcement, policing, and all those sort of things, he says something that most folks don't say often in these sort of spaces. He said, well, I want to also continue to fund these other type of programs around the city, these violent intervention things and all that. And though I still believe that it was still much a heavy law enforcement approach to it, there's something to be said that I feel like it's hopeful that more that that, that part about inc like doubling down on community resources, particularly these newer type of ones, for what it's worth, violence intervention and all these in this form, uh, the, the, the crisis management system, uh, violence interrupts, all those sort of things in this institutional form. It's no, it's probably 12, 13, 14 years old in New York City. I was the first violence interrupter mm -hmm. in Brooklyn, one of the first, right? So it's not all that old. But what I'm saying, there's something hopeful about the fact that there is a doubling down on the community that we can do. That, that, that makes me hopeful, and I say this with some level of, as I said, you know, I have a lot of disagreements with, you know, with the mayor, but like there's something to be said about that, that I think that not only for him, but other um, municipalities around the country should sort of pick up on that part. Liz, something that makes you hopeful? Um, I think that even though the pendulum sort of swings back and forth, uh, that we have substantially moved in a better direction in which it's not always all about the police and that people are actually embarrassed to say it's always just about the police. And I think you see it in Adams' platform, even if his tug is back to the police. I think you see it when Biden comes to town, and sure, the big thing is in the sea of blue, and he whispers across town, you know, at Queensbridge about violence interrupters, but he whispers, and there's some significant amount of money that's going to be invested in things that are not just, um, that are not just police and law enforcement. And so I'm hopeful that actual knowledge, the kind of work that Aaron's been doing and that a lot of other, Katerina, um, the next panel, a lot of people in this room have been doing, will have put a stake in the ground that where safety lies is investment in civic <laughs> services and in the people themselves first. Uh, and I think that's a hard thing to ratchet back from. Peter. Sign of hope. I'm not hopeful. <laughs> um, things can always get worse. <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful. But I mean, I don't know, but it's important to keep in mind. I think I'm hopeful. I think the pendulum has swung back a little bit from crazy into just moderately absurd. Um, I mean, the fact that we're having this panel. I mean, I spent all of 2020 saying this is literally the largest increase in violence in American history. And people with PhDs are like, oh. Don't worry. I mean, it was just, it was, there was a level of out of touch of reality that I, that, so I think we're at least starting to talk about issues in a real way that we haven't for the past two years, um, issues of crime and community and violence and policing. So maybe things will get better, but I, I, I no, I am not hopeful right now. <laughs> Aaron, can you bring us home with a slightly more hopeful perspective than that? Um, my, my training's in economics, which is known as the dismal sign. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I, I'll give a researcher answer. I, I think we know more than we ever did about what works and what doesn't to um, provide public safety. We, we know that with respect to policing, but we also have a, a wide array of evidence on non-policing strategies too. Uh, you know, better evidence than, than I, I think we used to have. So um, changes to the built environment. Um, you know, certain types of social services 
uh, you know, have been shown to be enormously effective uh, in, in reducing violence. And so, uh, you know, that's, that's, I think, a reason to be optimistic. Uh, you know, New York had very good leadership over the last, um, you know, so odd years. Uh, you know, I, I hope we'll, we'll continue to have leadership that, you know, is uh, focused on, uh, you know, being evidence-based. Uh, so, so yeah, I don't think it, you know, the world, um, you know, has to just go down this rat hole and not come out of it for, for 20 years. Uh, the other thing I'd say is, is, you know, I'd give a different answer for Philadelphia than I give for New York. Uh, you know, New York has obviously had a very bad couple of years, but, you know, we're operating from a, a pretty favorable baseline compared to other cities that are experiencing peak violence right now. Uh, so I, I, you know, I think all those things make me hopeful. That's a good setup for our second panel, which we'll delve a little bit deeper into the research. Um, all right, we're going to take a quick five-minute break, and we're going to return at 4.30. Um, but before we do, A-team, right? Pretty good. Thank you. Thank you.